My name is Betty McCray, and I'm coming to you from the television studios in uh, Senior Center in Iowa City, Iowa. And uh, we're bringing you another interview today about experiences of people who have served in the military. And I'm being interviewed by Carl Hilly, who is a member of our television crew, and our camera person is Nancy Lynch. So without any further ado, we're going to uh, let Carl interview me about my military experience. What were you doing before the war? I was a student at the uh, University of Iowa, uh, and I was a, uh, in the university near the end of my first four years when uh, uh, Pearl Harbor happened. Well, what do you remember about hearing about Pearl Harbor? Well, I was at home uh, visiting my family on that Sunday, and we had not had the radio on. And so I returned to Iowa City at the end of the day, not knowing that uh, Pearl Harbor had happened and that we were very soon to be at war. Uh, but as soon as I arrived back to the dormitory, of course, I uh, learned that this had happened. And uh, this explained that the friends that had picked me up uh, to bring me to Iowa City had had no conversation during the trip back. It was a very quiet uh, trip uh, with no discussion of the fact that, that uh, this was a momentous day in our history. Um, my brother was a freshman at the, uh, on campus, and he and his uh, friend almost immediately enlisted in the uh, Navy and went off to uh, begin their training. So what did you do in terms of um, your service? What, what happened? Did you volunteer or what? Uh, I uh, completed that year in school. Uh, the year was shortened because uh, the war had begun, but I com completed, graduated, and took my first job as a as a social worker down in southern Iowa. It was a very much a time of war, however, and the entire community uh, were involved in some way in the war. There was great concern about lighting cigarettes in the, uh, out in the open air at night, that uh, airplanes might fly over and see the lights. Uh, my roommate that I lived with during that year I was in Bloomfield. Her husband was already in service, uh, serving overseas. Uh, so we were very much aware of, uh, of uh, that the war was going on. My brother, of course, was in the Navy and my father had gone off to uh, the state of Alaska to serve uh, with the Army Engineers. So I decided that uh, if I was going to be a part of the things that were happening, that I should join the service. I attempted to join the Navy, but was too short. So I decided that I could join the uh, Army. Uh, you needed to be five foot. Um, and I learned that in the morning when I first got up, uh, I had a yardstick across my door and that was five foot from the floor. And when I first got up in the morning, I could knock the guard stick off the pins. By the end of the day, I had shrunk enough that I could not. However, when I joined the, uh, uh, when I took my physical exam in Des Moines for the Army, uh, they let me stand with my back to the wall. Therefore, I had no problem being five foot tall. And what did you do? Uh, training? What happened? What happened uh, after you joined? Well, I had never been out of the state of Iowa. And in due time, I received my notice that I was to uh, take the train to Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia. Uh, I was to go to St. Louis, Missouri and join seven other women who were also in the Women's Auxiliary Corps. Uh, and we made up a song, uh, the eight of us that joined together in St. Louis, we made up a song about being the seven oxies and a corp, because one of us had been designated as a corporal and was in charge of the eight of us to get us into Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia. And I found myself having a very queasy stomach for the first two or three days that I was there. <laughs> 
It was very strange and very different to live in a barracks with all of these other women, to stand in formation, to follow the orders, and to eat the army cooking, which I found very distasteful in the beginning. But after about three days, you begin to think, well, you're into this situation, and so you might as well figure out how to deal with it. <laughs> and uh, so life went on. I did my uh, basic training in Fort Oglethorpe, and then I was assigned to duty there as a uh, classification specialist, which meant I continued to interview new recruits and to fill out the paperwork that was the beginning of their personnel records and their military assignments. Uh, because I had been uh, a social worker prior to going into service, this was a very logical kind of an assignment for me to have. Uh, we filled out these personnel sheets, which were background information of uh, the women who were now in service. We were supposed to find out about their education, what special training they had had, what job experiences they had had, uh, and then to make recommendations for what possible jobs in the military uh, that they might be suitable for. And this was the beginning of the determination of where they were assigned, what training they received. The interviewing which we did, of course, was very important for the individual acts that we interviewed because we were the beginning of uh, what was going to become their military experience. And the, the kind of interviews we did determined what kind of training, what kind of experiences they had. And this was mostly women at this base? This was a WAC training center, so we had only women there except for uh, uh, a prison unit. And there were a few men who uh, were in charge of the prisoner of war, uh, German prisoners from the Ger uh, European front that were uh, also on our base. Uh, we, of course, uh, had very little official contact with either the men or the uh, prisoners. I was at Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia for about two years. And what did you do afterwards? After, uh, After you I, I, continued, I continued as a classification specialist. However, I had uh, some very interesting experiences during this period of time. Uh, shortly after uh, I had become settled, uh, well, probably six months into the into the war, or into my experience, uh, Colonel Hobby, who was in command of all WACs in the country, uh, and responsible for all WACs in the country, but had no command authority over any of them after they left the training centers. Uh, it, so she determined that she needed to have a better accounting of what uh, was happening to the WACs that were in service. So she set up a system of 10 teams of us, one uh, uh, officer and two uh, enlisted women, to go on tours to interview and report back to her uh, about what the WACs were doing. So I went on tour tours of d two tours of duty uh, on this kind of trips. Uh, we started out in Washington, D.C., and the first tour of duty covered the ground force stations across the southern states uh, to the west. Uh, the second tour of duty covered the Air Force stations on the west coast. And so for uh, a service woman who had never been out of the state of Iowa before she went in service, I had a great opportunity to visit quite a few uh, states. One of the experiences which uh, I think illustrates uh, both our experiences and what was happening to WAX was uh, on our visit to Luke Field in Phoenix, Arizona. This was a large, well-established southern military base under the leadership of, a old, uh, of an army uh, 
colonel who had had many years of uh, experience in the army who was not particularly pleased to have women the, uh, uh, on his base, but had a large contingent of whites. The duty of most of the servicemen at this uh, Air Force station was to wait for an accident to happen. They were a large repair uh, station, uh, so oftentimes uh, the military personnel were did not have a great deal to do unless there was a series of accidents, planes to be repaired, and so forth. The black unit had been there for quite a few years, but in just before we arrived, uh, the WAC commander had been replaced with a new and inexperienced commander uh, who was overwhelmed by the attitude of the general. Uh, also, the uh, the uh, chief clerk in the administrative office, uh, the staff sergeant, had just gotten married, moved off the post, was living in civilian quarters. So that uh, the, the women uh, in that WAC detachment were uh, very unhappy because the men in the unit had adapted the attitude of the colonel. And, uh, uh, which was uh, critical of the women that were in service. So we spent our three days there interviewing, having very unpleasant interviews because the women were very unhappy. Even though this was a plush assignment to be at a, at a well-established uh, military base uh, with, with uh, interesting things to do when, when they were busy. Uh, they were very, the women were very unhappy. But this was not usual. Were most of your wax uh, that, you, that you met and interviewed, were they happy with the their con jobs? The contrast to that was that the next base we went to was way out on the desert in southern Arizona. We traveled for hours in a, in a staff car to get to this base. We could see the base coming up across the desert sands and it was a huddle of black tar papered covered barracks. And our hearts sank because we were sure that we were going to have another three days of experience of listening to unhappy women. We walked, we drove into that base and inside of the circle of tar papered covered barracks with no trees was a very colorful courtyard with bright colored chairs and potted plants and so forth. The WAC detachment there that lived at that base had just won an award for their marching honors in some contest. It's, uh, they had a WAC captain who was not afraid of anybody and they were the proudest WACs that you ever met and it was such a surprise to meet them out there in the middle of the desert in these tar paper covered uh, barracks. Uh, and such a contrast to the, uh, our experience at Luke Field. I think it might be illustrative to talk about the two Christmases that I spent in service. The first Christmas I was at Fort Oglethorpe and there were four of us who received passes to go into town and we rented a hotel room and uh, we spent Christmas Eve and Christmas Day in the hotel room. We had all brought our packages that we'd received from home. Uh, we had, uh, we spent Christmas Eve, um, the three other three women went out to various kinds of church services in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee. I stayed in the uh, hotel room and watched a uh, service on the television station. And in the morning we had breakfast served uh, in our hotel room. We opened our packages, we celebrated Christmas, we shared stories. And I remember it as being a very pleasant Christmas experience. The next year I was on this tour that I was telling you about and we arrived from Portland, Oregon on Christmas Eve, uh, from Portland, Oregon through a very thick 
fog, we drove up to Seattle, Washington, the um, where we were to spend the uh, the next several days in the WAC with the WAC unit in Seattle. The WAC unit there was stationed in a empty apartment house at the top of a very steep hill, which was covered with ice and was almost impassable. The, the uh, women in the WAC unit, most of them had received uh, passes to leave the area. So we were in this empty apartment house, which was furnished only with military cots and, and chests of drawers. Captain Fallon was in uh, one apartment, and uh, my uh, friend who was I was traveling with was in the other apartment. We did not have any mail from home. We did not have any packages from home. Uh, so we went out and bought an artificial Christmas tree, which we furnished with uh, bridge tags and hair ribbons. And we bought presents for each other, like cigarettes, and matches, and boxes of Kleenex, and so forth, so that we had a stack of packages to open on Christmas morning. Captain Fallon decided to serve us breakfast in the, as I recall, a hot chocolate with scorched, but we still enjoyed it anyway. <laughs> and uh, uh, we had our scorched chocolate and uh, oranges and other things while we opened our packages. And then uh, uh, my roommate and I had been offered a Thanksgiving dinner by some family in Seattle. Uh, who owned a home and looked out over the Pacific Ocean. And it was a beautiful, bright, sunny Christmas day. So after sliding down the hill on the ice, <laughs> we, uh, we enjoyed a very pleasant Christmas day uh, in Seattle. I had the other experience I had because at the end of the second tour of duty, uh, we were on our way back to Washington, D.C. to uh, complete the, the tour before we were, were returned to Fort Oglethorpe. And I discovered that uh, the train was going within a few, few miles of, uh, was going through Fort Madison, Iowa, which is a few miles from where my family lived. And so uh, Captain Fallon did send a, tel a wire to Washington asking if it was possible for me to have a delay en route because I was going so near to, and, and we had completed our tour of duty. Uh, and I was granted, uh, received a telegram granting me a tour of duty. So I got off the train at Fort Madison, Iowa in the middle of the night and went off to visit my family. Subsequently, I did not return to Washington. I received orders to return to Fort Oglethorpe, Georgia. When I did return to Fort Oglethorpe, uh, I was called into the commander's office and, and informed that because we had carried our military records with us on our travels of the several months that we had been uh, traveling around, uh, it appeared from my record as though I had been absent without leave. Uh, because I had not been appropriately signed in and out of every station that we went. Well, because this was a clerical error and not a, and, and I had evidence that I had been paid each month, uh, they knew I was on duty and, and it was where I was supposed to be. So the records were corrected, but there was a few minutes there where uh, I thought I may, might be in very serious trouble. Because, because I was uh, in close connection with the personnel department at Fort Oglethorpe, uh, I was there until the, uh, Fort Oglethorpe was closed as a military base. And uh, those of us were, who were still uh, in the middle of our service, most of us had gone in, uh, pledged to serve for the duration plus six months. So when the uh, uh, war was winding down and we had settled the, the European conflict but were still uh, fighting with Japan, uh, the various, various bases, training bases, were being eliminated. 
and uh, Fort Oglethorpe was to be closed. Because I was working for the personnel office, I was able to persuade someone to take me off the troop orders to be transferred to Fort Des Moines, and I was able to get independent orders so that I could travel by myself without going uh, into troops to uh, uh, Fort Des Moines, where we were being transferred. I, w I was transferred back to Fort Des Moines, eventually reached there, uh, and was assigned to the mental health clinic in Fort Des Moines. The interesting experience I had there was, again, it was a hot summer, and uh, we had a case of uh, what turned out to be mass hysteria, which our uh, psychiatrist was able to identify and to uh, nip in the bud. It was a hot August time. We were still receiving new recruits into Fort Des Moines for training into the Y. And we had a batch of new recruits uh, who had not been there very long on this hot summer day. In the Des Moines Register that Sunday morning was a long article about polio, infantile paralysis, and the uh, kinds of symptoms that people were suffering from this dreaded disease at that point. Uh, this particular WAC unit was assigned to KP duty that day. And by uh, nightfall, several girls had gone on sick call with symptoms of polio. By midnight, almost the entire unit had gone on sick call. The psychiatrist, who was from a uh, famous uh, psychiatric clinic in Kansas, uh, determined that this was pro probably a case of mass hysteria rather than uh, real symptoms for the disease, and uh, did nip the thing in the bud by not admitting uh, the, the subsequent girls into the hospital. But we spent in the psychiatric unit a number of days interviewing and studying the results of this experience of all of the girls coming down with polio symptoms. Circumstances were were unearthed in our in-depth study of these girls, which I was a part of, and uh, which uh, brought some notoriety for the psychiatrist for having recognized so quickly uh, what was going on on this hot summer day in Iowa. Okay, now you were, you were in the service like three years, two and a half two years? Two and a half years. What, what did you, uh, what did you uh, learn from this experience? It was a very, it was a very rewarding experience to me. I, I had lots of opportunities to see things, to observe people, to, to uh, meet people, to learn to deal with situations which I had never had before, um, and of course earn the uh, benefits which go with, uh, which went at that point with serving in military What service. were the benefits that you received? Uh, I, my first house that I purchased was uh, through the GI Bill of our, the, the uh, loan programs which were available to veterans. And I was also able to attend the University of Chicago and received a master's degree uh, because of the benefits from the GI Bill, which I would not have been able to uh, have done without uh, the two and a half years that I spent. Did uh, you ever uh, receive any serious discrimination because you were a woman while you were in the, while you were WAC? On the contrary, uh, because I looked young and was small in size, uh, I was often considered to be much younger than I was until I appeared in uniform. And once I was in uniform, I was accepted as as being of legal age uh, when I would not have been if I'd been in civilian clothes. So in what ways do you think this experience has changed you? Other than the fact that it gave me, you know, many new experiences and confidence in myself for being able to uh, 
to uh, accomplish these things. Um, but those were all important to You might to have never left Iowa if, uh, if uh, you weren't, uh, you weren't drafted, you volunteered. They didn't draft Wax, or did they? No. So every, everybody you dealt was, was a volunteer. And uh, they had plenty of volunteers? Or did they have trouble finding women? I think because of the, the uh, uh, this was a time of war, and the attitude in the country during World War II was very different than it has been in some of the subsequent wars, because everyone was involved at some level. Whether you were, whether you were uh, uh, taking a job on the home front to replace somebody, or whether you were collecting tin foil and rubber tires to help the war effort. Uh, there was a feeling during World War II that we were all involved at some level in the war and that this was an important war, that, that democracy really was being threatened and it was up to us as the citizens of our nation to, to defend ourselves. And there was a sense of togetherness and real purpose that I think have not been uh, present in, in subsequent wars. You remember the, the, the day that the, um, the, the Germans surrendered and uh, there was a victory in Europe? Do you remember what happened that day? I was on a train that day. I had been visiting my brother in the Navy who was in Norfolk and I had gone from Chattanooga to Norfolk and was on my way back to Chattanooga when the an announcement came through that the Germans had surrendered. <coughs> There was great partying on that train coming uh, from Washington to Chattanooga that day. <coughs> I also remember the day that the uh, peace was signed with Japan. By that time we had been transferred to Des Moines and I was in downtown Des Moines when uh, uh, the announcement came through and the, it was, it was a frightening experience to be in the crowd with the raucous uh, atmosphere going on <coughs> because of the end of the war and I was very very glad to be on the last cable car going out of Des Moines back to Fort Oglethorpe and celebrated in the uh, PX at the base where it was much safer than to be downtown Des Moines. Did actually night. people get hurt? <coughs> well I'm sure there were some injuries it was like it was like a football Saturday in Iowa City. <laughs> there were cars tipped over and well, great excitement on the streets. Okay. Anything else you want to add about uh, your experiences? I feel very fortunate in my my military experience. Uh, I have always hesitated to encourage my friends to join the military uh, unless they really felt dedicated to do so because there's no guarantee of what kind of experiences you're going to have. I was fortunate and had very good experiences. <coughs> I can't talk anymore, so. Okay, so, well that's good. Uh, you, uh, thank you very much for your interview and uh, 